Hello and welcome back to the Media Box on the 28th session of the Congress and Local Regional Authorities. My name is Keely Sullivan and I'm joined here today by Ms. Mc Christina McKelvey. Ms. McKelvey, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. And just to begin, um, in talking about Scotland's last referendum in September, that is what qualifies as, as an example of good democracy because it was approved both by British and Scottish authorities. And now with that in mind, to what extent do you think that the Scottish example could be used as a model of good practices for governments facing similar cases of regions going through nationalist and separatist ambitions? Well, as, as you've seen from the, the referendum in, in September, you're absolutely right. The Prime Minister and the First Minister of Scotland both signed what, what was then tabled the Edinburgh Agreement, mm -hmm. um, which um, on both sides set down some agreements and some rules on how the referendum should be conducted. And, and the final paragraph is that both um, entities would accept the result. So, with that in mind, you know, a very clear um, diagram of how uh, to take forward something, you know, that, that is agreed by both entities and allows both of them um, to campaign in the respective camps in a very respectful and dignified manner. So, as you say, a template. Um, I don't think we've learned all of the lessons yet and there's lots of academic research going on um, on the impact of the Edinburgh Agreement and the process that took Scotland through its, its referendum um, and I look forward to some of that but definitely you know we, we, we are very very proud of the fact that we took forward our referendum in such a manner. And also, uh, what's very interesting to note, too, is the attitudes of Scottish authorities towards the European Union, which in some way um, contrasts strongly with those of the UK, which tend to have um, Europhobic tendencies. And with that in mind, how do you explain that gap between Scotland's position and the rest of the UK towards the EU? There's two, there's two ways to explain that. Scotland's very, very, very deeply steeped in being a European nation long before the European Union was ever conceived. Um, we have had, um, through the Hanseatic um, exchanges, very, very strong trade links with most of Northern Europe and, and further for, for many, many, many decades, going back a thousand years and more. You know, we've had a Scots College in Rome um, uh, going back hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, so that, that connection with Europe has always been much, much closer than maybe the, the, the rest of the UK. Um, Scotland tend to have, uh, historically, you know, the, the job of um, going out into the world to make friends, whereas, you know, maybe some others went out into the world to conquer it, um, which was a bit different attitude. So that brings us up to, to the to current position today. And what we see in Scotland is people understand Europe a bit better. And when they understand Europe a bit better, they understand the benefits of Europe a bit better. So that makes Scotland less likely to fall into the Europhobic trap, because I think it's a trap, I think it's manufactured. Some of the negativity about uh, Europe is similar to the negativity that we experienced in Scotland about Scottish independence. Um, we we recognise it for what it is, it's negativity. Therefore, people go and do their own research and realise the benefits from, from Europe. And our very own Scottish Parliament had a debate last week to debate the benefits to Scotland of being a part of the European Union. So the biggest threat now, post the referendum, is if David Cameron's returned to 10 Downing Street, Will there be a referendum on an in and out ref referendum, an exit from Europe? Now, what the Scottish Government are looking for is that if people in Scotland vote as a majority to stay in Europe, then we stay um, and not be taken out because our bigger, bigger partner um, decides um, just through the, a quirk of numbers to take us out. Mm -hmm. And um, in your opinion, do you think that this gap um, of ideals can be bridged? And if so, how? Um, yes, I think it can, because if we um, take some time to um, explain and debate in a reasonable manner the merits and the benefits of being part of the European Union, which isn't just about you know, the laws that that brings about, um, it's about the social contract that that brings about, it's about the partnership, the working together, um, the three Ps, you know, peace, progress and um, a prosperity for, for nations and if we can work together, especially in times of trouble, um, we all know the origins of the European Union, we all know where that came from, you know, we wouldn't like to go back to that type of fragmentation, um, we, we prefer to work together on it, so you know, I think given those lessons to people who are currently maybe Eurosceptic or not got much opinion on it at all, would maybe sway the vote to stay in Europe. And also, um 
What's similar is UK and Scotland's different positions on the Council of Europe. And just to give a little bit of context, um, Scottish authorities adopted a white paper on human rights in December of uh, 2013, and David Cameron and other members of his government have been critical towards the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, yet again, how can such a difference of views be explained, and what can be done to fulfill the gap? Well, there's a <clears throat> there's a issue within the psyche of being Scottish, and it doesn't matter whether you were born in Scotland or you've chosen Scotland as your home. Um, but there's a psyche of when something's not fair, it's not fair. Therefore, when we look at um, policy and progress on a political level, is it fair on the individual in our nation? And we believed the fundamental rights of our citizens stand above everything else. So hence the reason when the Westminster Parliament were going one direction on human rights, we went the other direction because we felt it was extremely important to ensure that you know, your right to, to, to life, to support, to health, to education, to all of those things that make a strong, prosperous, intellectual and happy nation are enshrined in our law. And that's what makes um, Scotland, again, a bit different. You know, there's, there's that genetic thing of saying about something being not fair, so therefore we strive for fairness in everything we do. And the human rights strategy was just one way of doing that. Right, and um, finally, researchers indicate that um, the longer young people have to wait to participate in political life, the less engaged they are in their adult life. And I was just interested to hear your opinion on that. Oh, well, I've got a very strong opinion on that because obviously we changed, we managed through the Edinburgh Agreement to change the voting franchise so that young people at the age of 16 could vote in the Scottish referendum. And that, again, ties into that fairness ideal in Scottish society mm -hmm. in that if young people, if we make a decision that affects young people, then they should have a part in that decision too. Um, and therefore votes at 16, you can pay tax at 16, you can get married at 16, and you can join the armed forces at 16 in Scotland. So therefore, why shouldn't you have the option to, to you know, decide who to vote for? Now, in, since the referendum, we, we've now managed to secure a Section 30 order, which was, is within the Scotland Act, because it's a reserved matter, to allow 16-year-olds in our elections next year. However, I believe that 16-year-olds across the UK should all have the right to vote. And you're absolutely right about that drifting away. My son, who is 16 and a half now, was not interested in politics at all. In fact, quite um, negative about it. Mm -hmm. However, when he realised he had the right to vote in the Scottish referendum, it inspired in him, in him something that has been magical. You know, his involvement in politics and his involvement in what does this mean for me and how can I influence this has been absolutely superb. And the... the um, result of that is the Scottish Youth Parliament elections that we have just a few weeks ago, we had many, many more young candidates stand for those elections because they realised that was one of the first steps to take at the age of 14, 15 and 16 to get involved in your local politics and do something with that. And I have to say that those children have inspired me greatly. And I take a wee tiny bit of credit because the Scottish Parliament didn't have parity across all of the parties on this decision for votes at 16, but post the referendum, I managed to conduct a debate in the Parliament that secured the support of all parties in the Chamber, including the Conservatives, um, to support votes at 16. Therefore, that's the reason the Section 30 order was put through and we will have votes at 16 in next year's Scottish elections. Thank you so much for your time, Ms McKelvey. I really appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.